very regretfully cannot accept this reward. Oh, wow. Most of us watching know how fucked up the Oscars are. It's an old ass award show jam packed in controversies. Moonlight, best picture. And desperate attempts to keep the viewership high when it's clearly dying down. But only a few know that this was going according to a scheme. A ploy fundamentally carved into the academy by a one guy to satisfy his own nourishment for power. You ungrateful bastard! I oughta cut your balls off! This is Louis B. Mayer. Well, it's an actor playing Louis B. Mayer, but he's doing it so well it's hard to tell who's who. Mayer was a Canadian-American businessman who served as the head of the movie studio MGM and created the Oscars. His career is full of some laudable achievements such as making MGM the biggest movie studio the US has ever seen, but it was also full of actions that led to believe he bribed law enforcement and covered up murder. Some consider Mayer as unequivocally a power-hungry propagandist. Others might see him as a genius entrepreneur who navigated his way out of poverty. So since we are just few days away from the Oscars, I think it's time that we take a look at this man and what he did. All the good and the bad and the ugly. Every energy Louis Bert Mayer was born to a Jewish couple in a small village in modern day Belarus. But back then, it was the late 1800s Russian Empire and it's not the best time for Jewish people. Anti-Semitism was a thing and it was getting harder and harder to peacefully live in Russia. So just a few years after Louis' birth, his parents decided to move to New York and then to St. John, New Brunswick, Canada in hopes of a better life. But it was anything but that. Mayer rarely talked about his childhood, but sources suggest that they suffered from major financial difficulties. Both of his parents are uneducated and had no valuable skills, and being immigrants didn't really help either. His father, Jacob, started a small business that would collect scrap metals and sell them to buyers in bulk. This required a lot of work, but since he can't afford to hire anyone, he tried to get labor from Louis and his brothers as much as he can. And this led to some messed up stuff. Jacob mentally and physically abused his kids and this caused a very tense family dynamic. It was a crappy childhood, said Daryl, Louis' nephew. But despite this, young Louis felt sort of a strong responsibility to help out his family however he can. He had a strong ambition. At just 12 years old, he dropped out of school to go full-time helping his dad collect medals. So he just went on and roamed on random streets with a car that said junk dealer and picked any scrap metal he saw. Mayor once said in a speech, My childhood was very poor. I had no education, no opportunities, no encouragement but I had ambition. This is also the time when Louis got his first exposure to the entertainment industry. So there was a small theater he used to hang around and it played live reality shows. So once he saved up some spare coins and actually like paid to watch the live show, Louis instantly fell in love with what he saw. When he was 20 years old, Louis moved to Boston to further expand the shock metal business. And this is where he meets his future wife. They quickly got married and they had their first child shortly afterward. But there was a big problem now. The junk business in Boston was a total flop. He made little to no money and even if he did, it was definitely not enough to provide for his new family. So he started looking around for other options. Suddenly, Louis had an idea. So for some time now, he noticed that there was a pretty big vacuum for entertainment among working class people. They would just go on with their work and didn't even consider entertainment as a thing. So it was clear to him that with the right execution, there's a huge opportunity in this untapped market. That's when he came across the opportunity to buy a small theater that had like 600 seats and it was totally run down for a relatively fair price. So he had some money he saved up from collecting medals and with the help of financing, he bought the place. The place was a mess. It needed a lot of work to like get it working back again. So he was like, fuck it and spent all of his time fixing it. But surprisingly, in like three months, he was able to renovate it back to a fully functional theater. Kinda impressive when you think about it. 
He was dead serious about the marketing of the theater. To attract the working class, he named the theater the Orpheum, a name that comes from Greek mythos, and chose to show mainly religious films with low prices. He even hired some random kids off the streets to like spread the word about the theater's opening. But he was a huge bet. Mayer had no prior experience with a project like this. I mean, all he did was collect junk. And if this doesn't work and he's unable to pay back his lenders, he's done. But as you might have guessed, that didn't happen. The campaign was a major success to say the least. Just in the first year of launching, people flooded to the theater and it grossed more than $25,000 which is over $800,000 in today's money. The business kept growing fast. It was so successful, the other theaters in the area struggled to even compete. And when the right opportunity came, Mayer bought them left and right for dead cheap prices. And he did not stop until he had the biggest theater chain in all of New England. But there's a fundamental problem when running a bunch of theaters like this, and Mayer saw it firsthand. See, the revenue of a theater highly depends on the film it at the show. If a movie is a hit, revenue goes up, and if it's a miss, income tanks and you lose a bunch of money. Makes sense, right? Mayer is kind of a man who craves for control, so to him, this is totally unacceptable. So he quickly calls his business partner, Nathan Gordon, and with his help, bought a film distribution company to buy movie distribution rights. So if you don't know, distribution is basically when you buy rights to an already finished movie and then you're the one who's gonna make the deals with the theaters and do all the marketing. This is probably Mayer's like first absurdly successful moment. In his first attempt at like trying to get into the like actual film industry, he struck gold. So Nathan Gordon and Mayer spent $50,000 to get an exclusive agreement for a movie called Birth of a Nation. It was a three hour long movie when most movies were no more than 40 minutes, but to no one's assumption, the movie was a national hit. Some sources say that at the end of its theatrical run, Mayer gained over $500,000 from the deal. That's like more than $15 million today. Now Mayer is like officially like super rich and he took all that money and moved to Los Angeles to try his luck at his biggest dream, making movies. See, his passion is not for directing or acting, it's producing. So since he got the money now, he made his very own production company to do just that. He called it Louis B. Mayer Pictures Corporation. Mayer made movies left and right about whatever he liked with whoever he liked. He made a bunch of movies with actress Anita Stewart and he posted them all over the newspapers and he's getting pretty good at marketing. The business is doing better than ever before. Since he both made the movies, distributed them and also owned the theaters, Mayer got to get rid of any middleman and maximize his profit along the way. And it quickly became one of the most profitable movie studios in Hollywood. But while all of these were happening, a businessman named Marcus Lowe is watching all of this and he's like genuinely impressed by Mayer. Lowe was in the middle of a deal to merge two of the most respected movie studios in Hollywood, Goldwyn Studio and Metro Pictures. This was a major acquisition at the time, but Lowe didn't know much about filmmaking in the first place, like he's just a money guy. So he needed someone like smart and well experienced to like be in charge of this new venture. So you see where I'm going with this? Yep. He asked Mayer to take part with him. And of course, he said yes, but he had a one condition. He wants his name added to the company. So after some back and forth, they finally agreed to also merge Mayer's own company. And with that, Metro Goldwyn Mayer was born. So under Mayer's leadership, MGM became the most successful movie studio in America. They made way more money than any other studio and way more movies than any other studio. Like on average, each year MGM had over 45 movies under its name. That's like almost one movie every week. For some perspective, Disney with all their like sub-brands only made 31 movies in 2023. And this time frame is also referred to as the golden era of MGM and these films are not like bad ones either like I watched some of them and they are pretty good and all of these accomplishments are all thanks to the unbearable intellect of Louis Mayer. Well 
Well, at least that's the fabricated version of the story that he wants us to know. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my very proud privilege to present to you Vice President of Metro Goldwyn Mayer Studios, Mr. Louis B. Mayer. In reality, all of this was a result of a series of brutal, absolutely unethical and egotistic business practices Mayer implemented. And I think this information is crucial to understand the full picture of his actual mind and what made him to start eventually the Academy Awards. Mayer built a picture of himself as an American patriot who appreciates the conservative way of living, which is ironic because he is a Russian immigrant from Canada. Fun fact, Louis Mayer is not even his real name. He changed this to sound more American. Mayer injected these ideologies he believed in into his movies too, which already had an emotional tone which made them stuck with the audience for a long time. You can clearly see it in his early movies he made with Anita Stewart and he carried that to MGM too. There are some rumors saying that he would like assault writers and like throw away whole movie scripts just because they didn't make him cry or had some non-conservative features. You would talk about your own mother that way? The woman who gave you life? You ungrateful bastard! I ought to cut your balls off! I will only make pictures that I won't be ashamed to have my kid play, said Mayer himself. His workplace image is not different either. He defined MGM as a dream factory and every employee is a part of a family and he presented himself as a father figure for them. I mean now we know this as corporate bullshit but at the time this was pretty new and this delusion he built amongst his workers made it easier to exploit them. At the start of the Great Depression, the banks closed down and MGM had trouble finding financing for their operations so they had to cut down costs. And you know what Mayer did? He gathered every worker at MGM to a hole. Actors, directors, technicians, everyone. And Mayer came on the stage with a sad looking face and gave his family take care of each other's speech and asked everyone to roll back 50% of their paychecks on the promise that he would pay them back once the banks reopened. They actually trusted Mayer. I mean, they loved the guy so much, they called him LB. So in their mind, they felt bad to let the guy down, especially after that emotional speech. I mean, they don't have anything to worry, right? I mean, he's just gonna pay them back anyway. I think the best part about this is that like he was making more than a million dollars a year, the highest paycheck in America. Another fucked up thing NB did was his influence over the contracting practice called the star system, which involves movie studios like MGM constantly looking for young and promising actors and employing them directly to the studio and forcing them to sign contracts that gave the studio the full control over their public life and restrained them from working for other competing studios. These people are called stars and they are part of the MGM family. Most of these actors like Greta Gerber and Clark Gable were in their early 20s when they signed this contract and they probably had no idea what they were doing. And some of these stars were little kids and there are sources saying that they despised working for Mayor and MGM but they were helpless cause they were bound by these paperwork. But I have to give Mayor credit for one thing though. So you know how MGM had the control over the public perception of these actors? They were held to very high standards regardless of what they are in real life. And MGM heavily benefited from this because it sold their movie tickets. In Mayer's own words, a star is simply an actor who has given the right kind of publicity. But also, when things go wrong, Mayer went so far than anyone else to protect his actors and the brand but not in a good way. Okay, so this action has a lot of alleged stuff, so I suggest you take it with a lot of grains of salt, just in case. So, the story goes like this. Clark Gable, the actor that I mentioned earlier, is very successful and has worked with Mayer for many, many years, right? So, one night, he was driving his car and dude was drunk as hell. He was driving as fast as he can, but he can barely make sense of what's going on and what he's doing. And it only took a fraction of a second. He lost control over the speed, crashed into another car, killing an innocent civilian.
Clark called LB and quickly he to capture. Mayor sent Clark into hiding and with the help of a corrupt local DA, he set up some random guy to take the fall in return for a lifetime payroll from the company money. Look, it's up to you to decide if this is true or just some hateful allegations but regardless of that, I think this is a really good example to show that there are some really dark places that connect with Mayor. Since Mayer made MGM super big and successful, he automatically became one of the most powerful figures in America and Mayer did not have state to use or mostly abuse that power. Once Mayer was the state chairman of the Republican Party in California and just think what a man like Mayer would be doing if he's involved in politics and he is involved like he was in the news commenting on very political stuff and like even met Winston Churchill for some reason. So, it was getting close to the election and Mayer wanted the candidate from his side of the aisle to win no matter what. And that's the reason why this piece of gold exists. Would you mind telling us uh, who your favorite candidate is for governor? Sinclair. Do you really believe that he can uh, end poverty in California? Well, no, I don't think so, but, uh, well, I don't know what to say about that. Mayer produced a series of fake newsreels that showed high-class, educated people supporting the Republican while others supporting the opposite. I am going to work for Marion because I need prosperity. But all of them are just some bunch of actors pretending to be and made by Irving Thalberg, Mayer's right arm. This is the textbook definition of propaganda. It's clear that this man is obsessed with using his power and influence to control people and has no ethical boundaries whatsoever. He just spread his things as far as he can without anyone even noticing. But little did anyone know. Gooby B. Mayer, this poor junk kid turned power hungry studio executive, is about to establish his command in the entire land of Hollywood. So it was the late 1920s, right? And a wave of unionization attempts was forming in the States. And it strongly transferred to the film industry because people are starting to notice that they are getting ripped off by people like Mayer. So it made sense to work as a large sum of people and have a stronger saying over things, right? This is Mayer's biggest nightmare. If his employees get into union, he would be left with no choice but to comply with their demands. That means increasing wages and lowering working hours, which we know he's definitely not a fan of. Things are spiraling out of hand and he pulled the last trick in his book. Mayer knew that it's gonna be impossible to convince them not to get unionized. It's too late for that. But you know what? All it took was one of the most famous business sayings ever. If you can beat them, join them. Mayer made a plan to start his own union that showed rainbows and sunshines and protected your rights. But unlike other business made unions, his plan is to get every single person in the film industry to join. And of course, if Mayer, this one rich MGM guy, is the only person who's gonna make it, it wouldn't be legit and nobody would trust it. And LB's solution to that is to invite Conrad Nagel, Fred Neblo, and Fred Beatson to dinner to talk about starting the organization. And remember, these people are are some of the most respected and powerful figures in all of Hollywood. On January 11th, 1927, a group of 36 most powerful people in the film industry got invited to an event in a hotel in Los Angeles. The invitations were sent by Mayer himself, but they didn't really think about it because he's very famous for having these random parties for arbitrary reasons as rich guys tend to do. But this was different. It didn't have Mayer's usual party vibe. The hotel wasn't even decorated and oddly everything was kept in a very formal setting. So it's Mayer who's on the stage now. He got to the microphone and showed them what he had been working on. It was a professional organization and he called it the International Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. From the motion picture capital of the world, Oldsmobile presents with pride the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Annual Academy Awards. 
Louis Mayer successfully executed his Hail Mary and just as he intended, the AMPS didn't give a shit about the workers and operated in the sole interest of a group of producers. By the way, they had to remove the word international from the name for some legal reason. But technically speaking, Mayer was never a direct member of the academy, but it's clear that he pretty much controlled it under the table using his producer friends. The first Oscar was given in 1929 and since then Mayer often appeared in them and probably gave the statue to the winners. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege this time to present to you Mr. Louis B. Mayer. Mr. Mayer is the gentleman who originally conceived the idea of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Mr. Mayer is also the vice president of Metro Goldwyn Mayer, whose artists won three of the first awards of the Academy this year. It was this quote from Mayer that basically like tempted me to make this video so bad. He said, I found that the best way to handle filmmakers was to hang medals all over them. If I got them cups and awards, they would kill themselves to produce what I want. So the Oscars have definitely lost its credibility over the years. I mean, it became so bad, now it's not even a union. Now it's just some award show with drastically declining viewership that you just watch to see if your favorite movie gets recognition or whatever. And I guess it's all thanks to this one man who just wanted power and control and exploit people to make much money as possible. Thanks for that, Mayor. Rest in peace. Oh, you still here? Nice. So, um, thank you very much for watching this video. Um, this is the longest one I've ever made and I have no idea how it's gonna perform. Like, it might flop, it might not. Like, okay, if this get more than 1000 views, I'm happy as hell. So, there's three things I think I had to mention. So first, please, please read the sources down in the description to get a better, like, understanding of this, especially with the Clark Gable thing because I kind of struggled to like decide if I should include that part or not because like I could not find any like rock solid evidence to like support that claim but also it's too interesting of a story to like not to include you know and also like Mayer and Clark are dead so <laughs> there's no way to know for sure but also there's another allegation for Mayer that he tried to sabotage a potential acquisition deal for MGM because he might get fired after it but not gonna lie it's kind of boring so um, check those out I think you might find some uh, good stuff there and also the fully detailed script for this video is available right now for my paid pitch on members that's where I kind of share my behind the scenes stuff my scripts notes and all stuff like that actually if you become a patreon member you get to see all my videos a day early before they're gonna go live here on youtube and also you will be credited as a patreon producer at the end of every video coming forward as a extra perk but truly it's just a way to um support the channel and you know help me keep making these videos because there are some gems out there that i don't see much videos about so i'm definitely gonna make those also, the third one, like, comment, and subscribe. Because that's how you should kind of know my videos are like worth caring about. So thank you very much for that. All right. Um, hope you enjoyed. Hope you had a good time. I'll see you in the next one.